can then can have a look if everything is like we think it should be because I'm mentioning some of the stuff also from last week. So mm -hmm. yeah, I'm I'm glad you do. Yeah. How has it been? Like, have they been in contact? Have you been working continuous? Have they are they just thinking about it now? Uh, yeah, yes, they're 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 still like like uh, processing. Um, they have they have a big like sales meeting in January, so they. Mm -hmm. All right. That's but the marketing guy that I normally uh, deal with, I had a call with him yesterday. And he said that uh, Mr. Müller uh, just passed him by on the, on the, at the cafeteria and said it was really great. He loved it and uh, looking forward to the presentation. So that's good to hear. It's uh, good, good feedback. Certainly. All right. Uh, Peter, we have people already coming in. If you want to keep anything as a surprise, then <laughs> stop hearing. <laughs> no, no, um, that's, that's fine. Uh, can uh, I start or just is that all right to uh, come second? Okay. Yeah, and uh, let's give it a few minutes to make sure everyone has joined. Yep. All right. Thanks. Right. Something to write. Yeah. yeah. Das Mikrofon war weg, jetzt sind die gut. Ja. Hello everyone, um, we will be starting shortly. We'll just take a few minutes to make sure everyone uh, gets to tune in. Thanks. Hi, Jutta. Hi, Markus. Hi, Hi Jutta. <laughs> hi, Peter. And hi, all, Erki and who else is there? Yep.
All right, guys. Uh, I think we can start. Um, so, welcome everyone to the to the third circular economy, circular design how to session. Um, Dan, I know you're busy. Glad you could make it as well. <laughs> Glad to see familiar faces. Everyone is welcome to open the video so we can see who is who are we talking with and who I'm talking to. You're welcome to join in at any time, just uh, raise your hand or unmute yourselves. Uh, hi, okay, I see you. Um, so today we have, uh, we have prepared the Estonian Design Center and we have a fun bunch of people here presenting today. Uh, two presenters as announced, we have Chris Sherwin from London, UK and Peter Post from, oh, sorry, Peter, you had to pronounce it yourself. <laughs> Ah, Wiesenbahn, yeah, that wasn't that difficult, but from Germany, let's say. <laughs> um, my name is Markus Wiesma, and I'm also working in circular economy. And uh, what this session will be about and has been about is to really dissect the practical aspects of circular economy. How can we go beyond the concepts? How can we look into the practice? And what it actually means to make this concept alive how to design for circularity, how to create systems for circularity, and if someone wants to do it, how can they start? So, um, but we had those two excellent people uh, talking, uh, talking about it and talking about their experience. So first off, we have uh, Chris Sherwin from London, as I said, uh, director and the founder, founder of Reboot and Innovation. I uh, was working uh, 25 years experience of circular design and strategic design in, uh, in sustainability. And very happy to have you, Chris. Uh, I don't, we haven't personally met, but I have uh, kept an eye on your activities and I see that you're, it seems that you're truly a powerhouse in the UK in terms of circular economy, having uh, co-authored and edited the last Ellen MacArthur Foundation report on upstream innovation. I also, uh, uh, like, uh, writing to the Guardian, uh, articles about circular economy. So I'm very happy to have you. And Chris, please, if there's anything I missed in the introduction, uh, please fill in. Great. Thank you very much for that. Um, <clears throat> so delighted to be here. Thanks so very much for the invite. Um, and um, just <clears throat> as a little extension of that, well, first of all, can you all hear me okay? Just want to check that my sound is okay. Good, good. Um, that's great. Um, a little bit of background. So um, I, I trained as a designer many moons ago, uh, more than two decades ago, and I, I was only a very average designer. Um, and the world didn't need another average designer. Um, and I thought also I wouldn't get a job. Um, so I chose at the time to specialize in what we called green design, and I never really left that field. Um, obviously, the terms have moved on and we've got better at it. But I think my entire career history is really working to somehow connect sustainability, what we now call the circular economy, to you know, design and innovation processes and product development. Um, and I now do that for a, a, what's what I call a boutique sustainable innovation and design consultancy, only doing really um, sustainability driven design and innovation projects. And I'll share two of those with you um, today. So um, if there's any um, design consultancies, um, most a lot of what I do, probably about half is for end clients, but I do occasionally team up with, you know, kind of design consultancies who feel like they've got a gap. And if anybody has, has work that they're doing where they need some support, please do get in touch um, afterwards as well. So, but just to... Um, to show the case studies this I think this always it's great that you're doing this Marcus because I think you know circular circular economy and circular design they can be quite abstract and quite kind of high level almost ideological or philosophical and I always think that this really works best when you just show projects <laughs> when you talk about the things that you've done and um, so I'm delighted to be able to forget about the models and the philosophy and actually just talk <laughs> talk about some projects and, and you know explore it through real um, through real experience and I'm going to do that with two two projects right and and actually the reason to show two is I think these do quite different things um, and tell tell really different stories right and the way I describe what I do right is that I my, my services really are about helping designers and innovators and clients with ideas or innovations for a better world and the ideas and innovations is probably an important split, right? Because some projects are upstream innovation, right? Where 
it's almost pre-designed brief where a client doesn't really know what the answer is. They're looking for a, you know, almost a more circular or sustainable idea. Right. And then I think other projects are much more sort of typically designed projects where a client has a blurred vision of a new product or service or business model, and they need a designer to help turn that from the idea into reality. And I've got two case studies which show those two different you know, the innovation, front end innovation projects and one which is more of a design project. First one is Yo Valley. You can all see that now, right? You can. Yeah. Is that is that is that on screen now? Super, and I'll go into play mode if that's okay. So this was a project from a couple of years ago for a dairy business, UK dairy business called Yo Valley. Um, a lovely business to work for, really mid to large business. Um, they, you know, lots of dairy products, milk, yogurts, cheeses, etc. cetera. Um, a traditionally an organic business, so, you know, quite nice to work with. And um, we we're actually set this um, particular project um, in partnership with their retail partner. So this was a retail, a retail um, product development team asking about, you know, how do we develop a toolkit to develop more sustainable and circular products? And actually the toolkit was really the lead for this. We're actually trying to produce tools that product developers could use to make, to inform their decisions. But actually there is an innovation that fell out of this, which I'll, which I'll talk about here. Um, and one of the things that the starting point really was that product developers, right, just had no idea how to make sustainable decisions. You know, they were fantastic at, you know, kind of coming up with new flavors or new, you know, packaging formats for next year or the year after, um, you know, that enhanced experiences or increased sales, but, but, but you know, kind of your average 25 department product development team just doesn't usually know how to start with sustainability big gap in their knowledge and in their uh, in, in, in their um, in their toolkit. So the tool uh, and what they said was, look, Chris, you know, we really want something simple. Just make this complicated topic really simple for us. Um, and this was the model that we came up with. Um, and it's quite straightforward. And I hope it explains itself just with a simple visual. Right. We created this hotspots matrix to kind of analyze the big you know, almost the, the big, we call them the material issues for, for a particular product category. And across the top, you'll see the main sustainability impacts of this uh, particular business's portfolio. So you see waste created in there or, you know, climate change or water or materials. Materials this is usually the circular economy one, but this looked a little bit wider. And then down the side, you'll see the traditional life, life stages of a product. You know, you, if you're making food particularly, farm ingredient sourcing you know processing and manufacturing packaging etc through to consumer and obviously what we did on this was to footprint if you like using hot spots the the big impact areas for for the dairy for dairy products the dairy products that yo valley produced for its retail partner and you know you were looking for the red ones really here this is this is the idea that you know kind of you can what's the bang for the buck where would you go for the big impact areas and I'm going to help you out here by going through this, you know, just to show you a little bit of some of the conclusions of this. So, you know, what do those hotspots tell you? What does that tool tell you? Um, it tells you that in dairy, we know that, you know, we know dairy production is, you know, on the farm is really energy intensive and has a high carbon footprint from, um, you know, things like um, growth hormones and, um, you know, agricultural feed and obviously the, um, farting and burping of the, of, the, of, the, of the cows, of the cattle in this case, usually is a big contributor to climate change. We actually know that with dairy products in general, it's quite a lot of waste at home, those consumers, right? They're really inefficient. Um, you know, so they, they usually often overbuy, you know, they forget about storing products at the back of the fridge, they mishandle things, they don't check use by dates. Um, etc cetera, etc cetera. so waste at home is a, is a is a big area in this particular category interestingly you'll see here that um you know packaging wasn't didn't come out particularly uh, impactful it was mostly to do with the with dairy products themselves um, but actually what, and this is the area that we went after with this particular innovation project we um, we, we discovered that there was a quite large percentage of ingredients in, uh, would become waste um in in manufacturing and processing and the reason was that their re a retailer, you know, like a, in this case, an Asda or a Tesco in Britain, or what would that be in Germany? It would be, you know, uh, I don't even know. Do you have Kesco in Finland? I think, uh, uh, yeah, I guess in, 
a couple, anyway, what, your big retailers, right? So they, they would request a new product once or twice a year, right? To just maintain interest in the category. And they would massively over forecast on the sales, right? We're going to sell 2 million units. And then when they're actually launched, they sell 200,000. And the manufacturer is left with the, with the waste ingredients. And they then have to pay, pay for them and pay to dispose of them at the end. Um, you know, when, when, when those products didn't hit the targets. And that could, in some cases, lead to six, between 6 and 30% of all those ingredients going to waste and, the, and, and Yo Valley paying for them. So we thought, ha-ha, that's really interesting. And uh, you've got to put some sketch in, sketches in there if ever you're talking to a design audience. So this is some of the work that we did, um, you know, off the back of that to, I guess, innovate using that waste area as a driver for new ideas. Um, so here's some sketches of the concepts. Um, and we were really interested in how you could use manufacturing waste as a, almost as a new flavor or as a new ingredient rather than it going to waste. You know, so on the left, you'll see a pick and mix idea, you know, where a dairy product would come on, um, you know, would come unflavored and you could just buy some, buy it and add, and add to it. And the ingredient flavors were based on whatever was, you know, a waste product in the factory at the moment, or whether there was an agricultural flush or an abundance of blueberries in the Isle of Wight here, you, you know, you could very much dictate your flavor by waste. Um, <clears throat> or actually, if you were selling a yogurt product or a dessert product, you could have a lucky dip. So we know that in most categories, 95% of all sales usually come from three flavors. With yogurt, it's plain strawberry and lemon, <laughs> and anything else is just noise. You know, salt caramel is just actually to maintain interest in the category. Um, so, you know, this could be the standard flavor and then a lucky dip, again, based on whatever waste um, there, uh, you know, there was available either in the factories or, or, or on the farms. And actually what Yo Valley um, went, I was involved more in the innovation and, and as a, in a catalytic role and Yo Valley did this as a result. Um, and I think the name gives it away, right? So it's a, it's a limited edition product that they um, produced and launch usually twice a year here in the UK. It's very neatly called Low Yo Valley Left Yovers. Um, and um, the flavors are dictated by, by the waste products. Um, so it's never the same flavor twice. And it's always a limited edition because, you know, you can only produce however much is, is, is you know, essentially waste product in the factories. Um, and I've seen six runs of this over the years. Um, and yeah, it uses, you know, the, the, the flavorings are essentially the ingredients that would be surplus or otherwise go to waste. Um, and there's a quite nice chari charitable donation to, um, to, a, to a, food, food, a food bank charity as well, Fair Share in the UK, where 10% of the profits goes to feed the hungry and the disadvantaged. So. so that's innovation, right? That's kind of tool development and much more upstream, you know, kind of designers, I guess, in the role of being, cat, you know, kind of catalysts for new ideas. We're doing okay on time, Marcus. Really, very well. Okay. But I'm going to go to a second case study, if that's okay. And this one is, I think, more of a traditional design project. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so that was, I wanted to also show something that was from a bigger company, actually, to show that you can do this with big companies. But the second one was with a, was lucky enough to work with this fantastic startup business called Winnow. Um, and I mean, these are, you, you probably you won't have discovered these uh, guys before, but um, if you haven't, they're really worth checking out. And tracking, and they're one of the best um, startup, small startups that I think I've ever, I've certainly ever worked with. Um, and Winnow is, well, I'll tell you what Winnow is actually. So Winnow, I mean, Winnow is tackling food waste. Ah, so both of my case studies I've just realised are about food waste, but this is food waste in a completely different way. I don't only work in food waste, by the way. It just so happens that these case studies are are about that. Um, so yeah, this is a case study of Winnow, which when I I was working with them, um, they were a 120 person. I mean, really fast growing business. Um, I was, this was 2018 through to mid 2019. Um, and so Winnow is looking at um, and trying to resolve this staggering fact, right? One third of all the food grown is never eaten. You know, we know that, I mean, that is essentially a $1 trillion market failure or some would say a $1 trillion market opportunity. That's the annual cost of wasted food. And that if you, you know, if you measured that as a country, food waste would be the third largest greenhouse gas, gas emitter, emitter after China and the US. I mean, it's an absolute staggering amount of food that we waste. Now, we know as a business, um, food waste is created in lots of different areas. And I know in the UK, households are typically the largest contributor to food waste. 
mean, that's not the area that Winnow's gone after. They've gone after hospitality um, and, and food services. It's not, not the biggest uh, part of the pie, if you'll excuse my, my pun, um, but it certainly is, it's big, right? It's a million tonnes every year, <laughs> you know, 900,000 tonnes of, of um, food wasted in the hospitality industry and in hotels and in restaurants and in, you know, kind of buffets and things like that, cafes. So that's what Winnow has gone after with its particular technology. But they've also um, kind of focused in on a particular area of hospitality, right? So essentially, if you think about a restaurant or a hotel that you stay in, there's usually two models of ordering food, right? There's a menu, you know, I order from a menu and it's bought to me. And when that happens, plate waste, waste from the plate is the biggest area of food waste. But actually, if you look at another way of delivering food, right, which is a buffet style, uh, that's, sorry, my, my phone just going off. Um, so uh, yeah, in a buffet style. So if you're in a you know you're in a five star luxury hotel, you know enjoying the warm weather in whatever it is Turkey or Dubai, um, they will have an enormous buffet. And actually, the big the big areas of waste, um, which can be between five and fifteen percent of all food produced, is is actually overproduction. Right? They just make too much and you know end up throwing it away at the end of the serving. And that's that's the area of food waste that Winnow has gone after. Um, and they've done it with this with this particular technology, right? And it, and it is obviously for professional kitchens in in the hospitality sector. And um, what I helped them to design and develop was was Winnow Vision, it's this this particular product. And I mean, it's a, it was a fantastic thing to work on because it's a kind of world first. You know, it's an AI enabled smart bin, um, smart scales. You know, that help a professional kitchen to. Um, you know, kind of measure and monitor and then reduce the amount of food that they're, that they're, that they're wasting every day. And I've got a little video that I can show you if it works. I hope it will work. Yes, it will. I'm just going to show you that in the background as I talk through what's going on here. You'll see the Winnow Vision product that I, and I led the product design of this. Um, and, um, you know, essentially it is, you know, a kind of digital scales with, you um, image recognition and machine learning, clever technology behind the scenes. And, you know, essentially a, those scales in the kitchen, um, you know, they take images and measure and recognize the sorts of food that the kitchen is throwing away. Um, and, you know, then it gives, um, feed, it feeds back uh, performance back to the kitchen managers and the head chefs uh, on a regular basis, telling them, You'll see from the image there what they're wasting, you know, in terms of quantities, costs, carbon footprint, and allows them to track um, performance over time. And why, I mean, this is fairly revolutionary stuff, right? But when a kitchen starts to measure and monitor waste, it's usually quite surprised at how much, you know, at the moment, before installing this system, right, they've got no visibility on how much food is going into the bin. It's literally a black bin. And when they find out, right, they're usually quite surprised because it's anywhere between two and 12% of the overall food, food costs per year. And that is roughly equivalent to the profit margin of a professional kitchen. So in a sense, they're chucking away <laughs> their profit on a daily basis. And when they find that out by installing this system, it's usually, it's usually quite a quick turnaround of, of improvement, largely driven by cost, but also, of course, driven by, driven by waste. Um, and you know what, what happens is within three to six months of buying and installing the system, um, they've usually cut food waste by about by roughly 50%. And the average kitchen saves about $75,000. And big kitchens in Dubai hotels can save four million a year. I mean, it's absolutely staggering the food waste savings from this. So, um, well, just some images of what happens. So, um, you know, literally, that's a that's a shot of the uh, from the camera on the on the underside of the of the uh, of the box that you saw design there, and that is uh, IKEA meatballs you'll see in there, and uh, and the IKEA um, dime dessert bar, and obviously, what the system is able to do is recognize those um, you know those those different types of food after being trained for a month or so on the menu. Um, and you know, kind of, and then, and then, and then, you know, start to sort of automatically over time, it can track and, you know, guess with a much higher accuracy than human, um, than hu humans' ability to be able to do this. You know, the, the um, human error was about seventy-five percent. This system's at about eighty-six to eighty-eight percent. And obviously, the gold dust in this. I mean, I work on hardware, right? I'm a product designer, but actually, the gold dust in in this system is, is the data. You know, it's, it's the service that the business gets afterwards and it allows them to do this, you know, on a daily or weekly or monthly basis. They get 
feedback on how much food they're wasting and the reasons for that and whether, you know, because it was raining that they overproduced food or, um, you know, was it, was it um, because whatever, they burnt the toast that morning and they threw away, a, they had a, an, an, up, a, an upsurge in food waste. Um, and once they start measuring and monitoring, it's obviously much easier to manage and, and to reduce um, food waste as a result. That's a monthly, and, and it start, you can start to gamify. So in a big corporate, you know, kind of headquarters, there might be six kitchens. And then you can also start to sort of track which is the most efficient and head chefs tend to be quite competitive. So they, um, you know, they really want to be the best performing and you know, best food, food, food waste savers. Um, all sorts of interesting stuff that you can get with this data. I mean, this, this system's in every Ikea in Europe, um, every kitchen in every, every restaurant and every cafe in Europe, and it's in 120,000 kitchens globally. I think before the, pa I mean, the pandemic has really affected hospitality. There's no question about that. Um, but this was on stratospheric growth um, before, before the pandemic hit. It was really, and that's the savings that this system makes. So, you know, 30 million reduced um, dollars of food uh, costs to clients every year. Uh, 18 million meals saved per year, 30,000 tonnes of uh, CO2 saved from being emitted as a result of this system. Marcus, is it, am I okay? I'm okay for time. There's one extra bit that I wanted to. Yeah, go ahead. So, I mean, in a sense, it's easy to just do good design on a sustainable product, right? You know, so that, that's just a story of being lucky enough to find a sustainable startup client. But I did want to tell one final bit of this story, right, which I think is quite interesting to this audience, a design audience. So what I really push them to do on this, on the design process is actually to eco-design their sustainable product. <laughs> you know, in a sense, you know, to sort of think about making smart design choices, even in the design of a sustainable product. And I think increasingly we've got to do this. Like we can't, we can't sort of forget our responsibilities to just do good design, even though we're working on inherently sustainable products, in the, uh, as was the case here. So, um, so I plugged in some classic, you know, kind of what I call eco-design here. And I'll just show you a couple of images that this, what this helped us with. Um, so, I mean, it's just, it's just typical kind of LCA type work. So I, I, as we were working on this, I, I was just super um, keen that, that we start to, um, you know, so there was, there was a prototype beforehand and I wanted to make sure that the new product that we designed had a lower footprint than the, than the, than the prototype beforehand. So I spent some time um, footprinting, you know, using a, using a lifecycle assessment software tool um, the predecessor, the, the the prototype, and that was the um, picture that we got. That actually, material choice you'll see on the left hand side. In fact, in both cases, it's telling you that um, you know actually materials and manufacturing is the largest area. It's not it's not energy in use. You know that system doesn't use a, a ton of energy. You know it's really about the materials that you specify and use in the design of that particular piece of hardware. And if you look at the image on the right, it's broadly saying that it's about the foot, you know, the carbon footprint of one of those hardware systems is about a ton over a three year use cycle, 995 kilos in this case. And I think what, what I'd said was, you know, I want to get this down by about, you know, 10% reduction, um, you know, in, in the new design in comparison to the old one. But actually, you know, in a sense, just looking at the hardware doesn't give you the full picture, because of course, we were lucky enough with this system, um, you know, that actually it's, its core function, its core purpose, is to save carbon. <laughs> so bizarrely, right, um, that one ton footprint of the hardware is massively cancelled out <laughs> by the, on average, 120 tons of carbon that using the system <laughs> will, will deliver over, over, over three years. And I mean, in a strange sense, it doesn't stop us from doing good design, right? But we could have made this out of, I don't know, plutonium or rhino horn, and we would have still been in credit on <laughs> On, uh, on on carbon emissions here you know it's literally and I, I mean it's almost it's a factor 100 saving in the use of the product in comparison to any design decisions we made but that shouldn't stop us from taking our responsibility in hardware design and that's what we did here um, so anyway we that's the that's the bill of materials right and essentially I mean I won't go through this in in, in, in an enormous amount of detail but what we found was you know, kind of of the of single components, stainless steel, right? In, in, in professional kitchens, stainless steel is a really good material to use, you know, obviously because, you know, it's correct, non-corrosive and easy to, you know, wipe down and, 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 and hygienic. And that's why when you go into a professional kitchen, lots of products are made of stainless steel. But actually, footprint of stainless steel, I mean, it's got some quite 
toxic processes and toxic materials sort of built into it. So it led us to that question of, and, and it, well, interesting as a component also, the tablet, right, was a really tablet that you saw on there. I mean, the footprint of anything electronic is usually quite large. Um, and actually the tablet was really, you know, with a small scale company buying tablets from a, from big companies, very little you can do to influence, you know, kind of Panasonic to make, <laughs> to make different tablets. You know, we were just far too small a supplier. So, so actually this gave us at least some design levers to think about. And I think I've got some, I mean, this is just going through the design process, right? Looking at, in this case, looking at different alternatives to stainless steel um, in different versions of the design. And you'll see that at the top, you'll see the original prototype which was, you know, a little bit like a suitcase with some wires coming out of it that worked <laughs> on the wall. And then various design iterations here in different materials, you know, in stainless steel or in aluminium or in straight steel or in galvanized steel with a powder coating. And as an alternative to stainless steel, which as I say is quite impactful and actually more toxic than it is um, uh, 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 having a larger carbon footprint, actually galvanized stainless steel and powder coating proved to be actually the best, the best design choice here. And that's actually the one that they went after. Um, and it's actually cheaper as well to make something out of powder coated steel and you can have all sorts of funky colors on there um, and it's still you know kind of will will doesn't really affect the um, lifespan of the product it still functions perfectly well over three years so i guess that's my story that's the end that that is you know one case study that was of yo valley looking at innovation another one that was of you know kind of designing and then eco designing a sustainable product um for for winnow um and um that's that's me done. Um, thank you very much. And um, Marcus, how do you want to do this? Save questions or take questions now? Or? Yeah, let's take some questions now as well. Uh, super cool uh, examples. I especially enjoy how this uh, two things are completely of a different nature. Uh, like one is well, like both design projects. One is uh, like you know, this technological futuristic da da da. This kind of super cool thing, and the other is just like kind of common sense design something that the industry is just lacking and just using whatever is there and having uh, allowing for variability, which I think variability is, can be very, very attractive. And, uh, the, and, we, and the winnow is, of course, you have endless correlations with what you can do with the data. You can add like if it, the restaurant is in a hospital, in a, in a hospital or in a hotel somewhere, you can just uh, correlate the data with uh, people staying over or people currently in the hospital admitted and so on. So I, I think it's, it's, it is kind of the leading innovation or the future innovation in the kitchen that hasn't innovated for a long, long time. Mm. So, um, you said you, you're doing, uh, uh, you were using software to do like LC analysis. I imagine this takes quite a bit of time, like first to understand the concept, but then making those small design decisions. How do you usually go about it? Like if the, you have so many choices to, to choose from. I mean, that's quite, I, I chose, uh, so startups typically don't have 30,000, you know, dollars or whatever it is, euros to spend on expensive LCA consultants. So that was quite quick and dirty, right? And I, I basically found and licensed for the six months of that project. I mean, to be honest, one of the cheaper <laughs> LCA tools, um, a tool called, um, I think it's called Sustainable Minds. Mm -hmm. And on a license, it's about $1,400 to, to hire. And, and they're obviously, I think there are more robust in truth and more accurate. Don't tell sustainable minds I said this, right? But I think there are, you know, bigger, sort of bigger, you know, more robust tools and probably even more up-to-date tools, you know. So if you're working with a corporate client, they've usually got LCA software and usually LCA specialists of their own internally. But in this case, you know, with a startup, we kind of had to do that quite um, quick and dirty. And I mean, I wanted to do it to introduce them to that concept. And in, in my, my idea, we should just be doing, that should just come as standard in design. Right? So I, I think the sort of stuff that we were doing there is just like, I, I see it just just like safety, right? You'd never design an unsafe product. Mm -hmm. you, know, actually, you know, it just is bad design. And I think it's the same to, you know, kind of, I guess, apply those principles of kind of good eco design. Whatever you're designing, have a think about how you can minimize the footprint as a standard. And I really, you know, I try to do that in every, every, every physical thing that I work on, you know, to design. I'm always, sure. even if the client doesn't ask for it, <laughs> you know, I'm kind of trying to, trying, trying to, trying to build in some of that stuff. But yeah, that was a cheap, and, it, and because it's a cheap, it's almost, I feel it's probably slightly more like a student software <laughs> in a strange way, you know. Um, and, you know, it was probably no more than, I mean, it's a few hours, right, to, to collect the data. And, 
Um, you know, you usually have to disassemble a past product, right, to get weight, things like weights or, you know, have a bill of materials or, or those kinds of things. And that's usually fun to do, right? You know, kind of quite important to, I think, also a really good way of kind of getting to know your, your product properly. Because actually when you disassemble something, I mean, they call it a teardown, don't they? You know, kind of there is a formal process for tearing down a product to understand things like, well, you know, what's that space doing there, you know? Kind of why why is this component next to this component and you know all oh, this was really hard to get the printed circuit board out that would be bad for a recycler so i think you know there's actually a good i think it's, it's not weeks to do that right it's more hours and potentially a couple of days and once you've plugged it in once that so that particular software allows you to iterate new design you know new new design iterations allows you to um, check design iterations actually quite quickly mm -hmm. by just saying well look i'm going to take out in that case, stainless steel and plug in, you know, powder coated steel and, and the data already exists in the software to do the, uh, to the, do the impact analysis for you. You mentioned that uh, product developers and product design, uh, designers usually don't know how to make the sustainable decisions. This is one of the tools to help them know. Uh, can you elaborate more on what you might mean by like, what are the decisions, what, what sort of decisions are the sustainable decisions that they, let's say, usually don't know how to make? I mean, it's usually about, um, uh, okay, I'll mention two. So what, I mean, the most obvious question that I get from people is, um, and it's usually from design agencies, I want to do a sustainable design project. What materials should I choose? Right? And it's literally, you know, that's, li that's it in 90% of cases, right? That's, it, go it goes exactly like that. And of course, my question is usually, you know, are you sure that changing materials is the right <laughs> thing that you should be doing in design? Because there's a bunch of other strategies you know, and I, th I think it is kind of circular design strategy before you ever get to choosing materials, right? Work out whether, you know, the thing that you're working on could be repairable or last longer or dose the product better or any, <laughs> any, you know, any number of strategies before you even get to the material questions. And even then you get to the material questions. And in general, designers, of course, are not usually specialists in sustainable materials. And I'm not, you know, I, I probably know more than your average designer. You know, I know, you know, kind of, I picked it up on projects, but there are material scientists who really deeply know all of this stuff. Um, uh, I'm sorry, Marcus, I've forgotten the first, you asked, you asked another bit to the question. Well, that's it, like you said two things, one is material, but the other is the strategy before the material. Yeah, I think that's really important, I think, you know, kind of to, you know, don't, don't dive straight into thinking that circular design and sustainable innovation are just about switching materials, right? Because that actually, what that does is, if, if you're a designer, right, it resigns circular design to just circular materials. And there's a whole bunch of things that you need to do beforehand to think about, you know, that, that, are, that are potentially much more impactful. It means the concept is locked down. <laughs> there's no potential to change the concept. And it's just about kind of switching one material for another. And I think that is really limiting for, for, for circular design. Completely agree. Uh, yeah. Might you have, you were curious about the uh, Fairphone. Would you like to ask uh, what are you interested about it, especially? Mike is looking for the unmute button. <laughs> Peter, uh, you want what, to jump? Yeah, I would have a question. The, the, uh, the pro uh, project for, um, what's it called? Yeto? Ye Yo, it's difficult to say, right? And <laughs> Yo Valley. Yo, 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 yo. <laughs> exactly. Uh, you showed those sketches and, and one of those was uh, a bit more, probably more complicated to, to, to put together because you, you kind of delivered the, the, the flavors with it. And finally, you, you and the client decided for a more simpler um, approach where the whole thing is already configured when it gets to the yeah. client. Uh, did you test that with, with clients to find out if they find this fun to, to mix it themselves? Or why did you decide for that more classical Actually, thing of you, you, you get something that is ready? Yeah, that's a good, I mean, in a sense, your, your um, question, I think, is about the difference between a retail experience and a pa packaging, you know, package product experience. And so my, my role in that project was largely to step out after concept design was done. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, I deliberately, and also actually after the tools were developed. So in a sense, my, my biggest contribution to that is that, you know, that the, the matrix that you saw yep. now used in those, in the project partners, like on, on every product development process. Uh, that's, that's the success of my pro project. Right? And actually we did that, we did that um, 
the the, co the ideas bit afterwards as a catalyst to show that actually you know this is what you don't just count stuff right you can actually use you know don't just get nice hot spots and do nothing right you can use this as a jump off point for innovation and you know but in a sense we we had no role afterwards and you know as such um, it was with uh, it was with Asda is a retailer and Yo Valley and Asda weren't very it's fair to say weren't very um, motivated to do any, you know, tests internally afterwards. But interestingly, the dairy, Yo Valley, took the ideas and did it themselves internally and launched it as their own, as a Yo Valley brand. And originally it was supposed to be an own brand, Asda. Okay. So Asda, had no, Asda wasn't interested in the ideas. They didn't think it was big enough. But Yo Valley went internally and, and, did, and did that innovation themselves. And I wasn't involved in that, in that actual product development myself my role was more catalytic in the upfront ideas and particularly the tool development and, and that happens sometimes right as a designer you you know you sort of you do the, the front end bit it's sometimes the and then you cross your fingers that anything happens afterwards and in nine out of ten cases it doesn't <laughs> in this case is it did yeah and um you know I'm, I'm, I'm pleased with that and i think yeah I, I can't claim that it was it was in any way influential in, in designing that particular yogurt. And I think, you know, you can see where the idea came from, um, you know, through, through the development of that tool and Yo Valley going, going through that with us. So I want one final thing, right? And, and I'm aware that I'm eating into your time here, Peter, and I'm sorry about that. No problem. <laughs> um, but um, interestingly, the project was paid for by Asda and, and Yo Valley together. And Asda was not interested enough or brave enough to do it. Yo Valley did it themselves and then launched it through Tesco. <laughs> and, and actually Tesco loved it, right? And it got lots of PR. And uh, so, so you kind of, that's that catalytic role that sometimes, you know, kind of the clients who pay for the projects are not the ones who, who, ben who benefit from it afterwards. But um, live. Um, my, my, Mike was curious about the, the Fairphone project as well. And uh, I also had a question about the matrix, but uh, maybe we can keep some of the discussion for after uh, Peter has also presented. So like, uh, kind of, we have to be mindful of the time um, because opening a completely new topic will probably uh, just excite our minds too much. So we can't stop. Um, <laughs> thank you, Shay. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I think it's excellent examples. I uh, really love listening to them. And Peter, uh, happy to have you here. And Managing Director of Schultz and Volkmer, uh, design UX design user, user basic user center design in, in Germany, several offices. And uh, he, you know, Peter himself is a seasoned UX designer. So that's like uh, understanding of how the user behavior around any product or service should be or could be and could be designed. I'm very happy to have you. We worked recently together as well as so we got to know each other. And I, I like your approach and I think I'm looking forward to the discussion you have here today for us. Thank you, Peter. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you, Chris. Very inspiring, took a lot of notes. Um, and in a, in a way, there's there's a connection because you you had this one uh, project which has also uh, uh, at least for the professionals in the kitchen a kind of user interface, and that's what we are uh, busy with. I uh, today I don't show a finished uh, product or project, but Marcus thought it is okay to to show like a conceptual study. We finish stuff actually. We do projects that get kind of out of the market. I will just show one example so you get an idea what we're doing. Um, in that field. I will share my screen now. I hope that works. You see anything? Yep. Okay. So what I want to discuss with you, and this is really like a, like a conceptual approach at the moment, something we call circular experience design. So this is very much focused on the end user and his role in, in sustainability and in, in a circular experience. Um, one example of a, of a project that we uh, did to, to give you an idea where, where our worlds of user and digital design um, comes together sustainability because sustain, sustainability is a big focus of the agency was this project here for Deutsche Bahn, so German Rail. It's a, it's a small um, or medium-sized uh, train station outside of Hamburg and they actually pitched this 
this uh, this train station, which was fun to do because normally we, we pitch on websites or apps or stuff, and then we had to pitch on a train station. And the job was to make this more sustainable. And we don't know anything about train stations. We we work since ten years for Deutsche Bahn. We do the the travel app, websites, stuff, uh, campaigns, but we never actually got into to hardware. But it was a fun project to do. So we thought about all the things that happen in and around such a train station concerning food, using the space to grow food, uh, using the space to sell local products, thinking about the mobility to the train station and from the train station. And that piece I want to show because that's one of the projects that we actually implemented a few weeks ago. And the idea here is to motivate people to come by bike uh, because they have this big parking lot, uh, but which is kind of uh, uh, inefficient. And an insight was that the, the German rail would love to more people to come by bike to train stations because managing traffic and managing parking space is, uh, is, uh, is, is a big effort, but not that a good business. They would like to use that space in the future in a different way. So they have a, an economic interest in, in people coming by, by, uh, by bike. So what we came up with is an app that actually tracks people um, uh, when, they, when they go by bike and you can use that as money. So you can pay with, with kilometers that you went by bike. I just show you this, a small video. I hope you can, uh, does that show? You see the movie? Yeah. Okay. So this is the app. It's very simple. You, you put it on your bike, you start it, and then you have a very sweet uh, animation that shows you what you're doing. And you're basically just connecting or collecting kilometers. And, um, after a certain while, you can uh, exchange that for products in the, in the city. So we also did all the talks to the local shops who uh, we had to convince to work alongside this, this, this uh, project, which, which is most of the hassle. Programming apps is one thing, but talking to the owner of a bakery to give his coffee away for, for less is uh, a big challenge, I can tell you. But it worked out fine. And um, another thing we worked into the project is that um, next to the small things that people get in and around the station, uh, every 10,000 kilometers that they all cycle together, they get like a big thing. Like uh, now we installed like a repair station for the whole fleet of, of bikers. So that's what we do a lot, like uh, doing incentives for, for people. So I'm doing this for myself but also creating kind of a community um, that shows, well, I'm, I'm part of a bigger movement here. And if you all do this together, we get like cool big stuff from Deutsche Bahn. So this is an example of a project we did. And from that comes the notion of circular experience design. So um, uh, what is that? This is like, basically it's user and, and, and service design, user experience design and service design for the circular economy. Um, and it's very much focused on helping people to do stuff they will have to do in circular economy with products that need more than just usage. So that's like the, the user experience design uh, focus on that. But in a way, it, it, it's also aimed at creating long and lasting relationships between people and stuff because uh, also our industry, the, the advertising agency, did a very good job the last centuries to teach people that it's cool to buy new stuff every every year and we have to change that we have to change the narrative into it's cool to take care of stuff for a very long time and make this fun and make this a, a thing that people actually want to do so why do we need this um this is a very simplified model of, of, of circular uh, processes and of course we know the, the the heavy lifting is done in in the in the design phase where it's about materials and manufacturing and coming up with a whole concept as chris just pointed out this is not the territory of circular experience design because this is the territory of product design and development so 80 percent is, is not where we're heading we're talking about the other 20 percent where actually the user has to do something it's it's a smaller part but as we don't know any, as nature we don't know anything about product design we had to use a spot where we actually can help. So this is about where users come into play and where they might th do things right or wrong concerning circular economy. So you all know the, 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 the concepts behind this. I can flip through this. So from an industry point of, point of view, there's a moment where after we designed and, and produced the product, we, say, uh, we sell it 
and uh, then we can earn money with servicing it in the circular economy by refurbishing it and by harvesting it. Of course, there are other models, but that's like basic, the basic business models here. And from an owner point of view, at a certain point, a point I buy a product, so I get some added value here. And I can participate in the retention of the value, maybe in increasing the value by upgrading it. And, and if I put it back into the cycle, I might participate in the exchange of the value when it when it's returned. So that's like the, the, the business part from the from the end user. And like the emotional benefit is familiarity. Um, so instead of buying new stuff over and over again, I can kind of get used to my product. I get well at using my product. This is like the paradigm of communication that we have to change. Um, if I'm just a user, so I don't own it, the product anymore, so this would be like a product as a service model. It even becomes more simple for the end user because he just gets access to a product and he gets the performance of the product. And all the nasty circular economy stuff is done by the company that still owns the product and, and takes that from my shoulder. So it's a big difference whether I'm the owner of a product or I, I just get access to it in a service model. And then, of course, it's not about familiarity because probably the, the product uh, changes um, uh, during uh, my life cycle. So this is more the emotional benefit here is more ease of mind. I don't have to think about it. Someone else takes, takes care of that. Um, how does um, circular experience design work? Well, it's basically based also on digital twins. Um, we all know the concept in an industry for no. For uh, 4.0 that is already used and you have interfaces like this so this is like the user experience of a professional taking care of that big machine and you also have stuff like this but you as you can imagine this wouldn't work for end consumers so if you want end consumers to somehow be part of the management the ma maintenance uh, of, of products you you have to take a different uh, approach um, so what it, again this is not a, a, a finished uh, product or project that is like a con conceptual study uh, that we did based on an on an e-bike but it gives you a kind of idea how that how a thing like that could work and weave into the daily lives of people so uh, one thing is that probably this thing would talk to me so as a digital twin of my e-bike um, I have an e-bike my own and um, e-bikes um, E-bikes, as we all know they, they have some environmental issues because of battery and the and the and the uh, uh, CO2 used for production, which is much higher, uh, almost three times as high as with a normal bike. So, um, um, an e-bike is only a good e-bike if it's uh, if uh, if it takes one car from the street. So that's that's the basic pitch when it comes to uh, environmental issues with e-bikes. So it's very important that it's safe, that it's well maintained, repaired, and that you use it for a long time and not buy a new one after one year. So I have this digital twin of my bike, and of course I want look into this thing uh, because I've, I have other problems in my life. So it, it addresses me on my home screen. It tells me, well, there's some maintenance to do and probably you get a price off if you do it now with the gear check with the local dealer. It also lives as an app on my, on, my, uh, um, on my smartphone. You can see this here. And as you can also see, there are also two other digital twins of my car and of my fridge living here. I will talk about this later on because as you can see, with one or two project, uh, products, it could be fun if you have like a lot of stuff at home and every product has a digital twin, it gets kind of annoying. But bear with me, I will keep to this e-bike thing for a while. So then we have like, in this case, we have like three scenarios. One is about upgrading, the other one is about maintaining and repairing, and the last one is about actually selling the product. And um, the thing that we believe is quite essential is, is what we at this moment is a working title called a value range. Um, I will talk about CO2 and other KPIs later on, but we believe that actually money value would be something that people get. Um, because in our experience, you can talk about CO2 to end consumers a lot. They simply don't get it. They can't understand this as a kind of currency. They don't understand if one gram of one kilogram of CO2 is a lot. or, or So you, you need another data set, another KPI. Uh, for uh, for end consumers, at least this is our experience in projects. So um, this is just a very short use case about upgrading. So um, I was attended that maintenance uh, at this moment would be a good idea. Oh no, upgrading is a good idea. Um, the use case here would be I have a 25 kil kilometer per hour e-bike. It's actually what I'm riding. 
And uh, there are e-bikes uh, that ride uh, 45 kilometers per hour. Normally you bike in a, buy a new bike, which of course um, in, in sense of circularity is not that a good idea. So if I want to commute with that bike, it could be interesting to, to upgrade it to the 45 uh, kilometers. And this is the use case. So I see within the app what kind of possibilities I have to upgrade it, several packages that I can book and buy. And I also can see, because of course they, they cost money, how much they would improve also the value of my bike. So again, the value, the actual money value, um, financial value of my bikes, like, like the essential KPI that the end user is interested in. So this is about upgrading it to give it extended use, extended lifetime, because I will use it longer instead of buying a new one. And of course I can also book that the service directly from the app. Another one would be maintenance. So here at the one point you can see where maintenance can be done. I can also see that at a certain spot I need to maintain something. And I also can use this as a kind of marketplace. So um, I can, can broker that, that interface to a local dealer. And he says, well, there's a, there's a bike and uh, it's due to uh, maintaining a certain piece of that. And I will um, offer this guy a discount on it. And I directly see it in the app. So it has to be very convenient, very easy to book that stuff and always um, come back to people and tell them, well, of course you have to pay for this, but it also does something for the value of your product. And the last one is rebuy, uh, which is a bit strange, uh, but uh, we, we thought it would be a good idea that actually the moment I buy the bike, it already starts to sell itself again. So it's always on the market. It's, it's always looking uh, at where there's a point in the value curve where it would be interesting to either give it back to harvest its components or to sell it uh, so it keeps in circulation as long as possible. Um, when we discussed this with a client, he found it very strange because, well, actually the guy just bought the bike. Why, why, he would, why would he immediately want to sell it? And said probably he doesn't want to sell it, but the materials, the components, they want to stay in the flow. So that's why it's important to regard it as a marketplace. And that would very simply work like this. So you see on the, on the value range between, in this case, 2,300 and 1,800, who would sell or who would sell it or buy it back into the market. And you can choose with whom of these providers you would like to go. So these are just three use cases. Um, uh, based on this, of course, you can come up with others. Uh, another thing is this one, like a value curve. So you have, a, you have an, uh, um, uh, an, an optimized, uh, the, the best value curve of that bike. Of course, it goes down. It's, it decreases in value. And you can see how your own bike is doing compared to this. And if you tell yourself, well, I would like to keep up the value of my bike, um, the app would recommend certain um, activities like repairments, maintenance you can do yourself, or upgrades to keep it as, as high as possible. So these are like the basic, I have to, to, to um, hurry a little bit. So one thing is that we very much believe in, because we tried with a lot of projects, that CO2 is not the way to go. Of course, for, for us, it's a very, very important uh, currency. But uh, yeah, we think that that actual value, money value, would probably be what people understand and where they also see an incentive in doing that. So our, our hypothesis with this is users will not care for products just for the benefit of the environment, but they care when they benefit in somehow personally. So by value or by expertise and social status, uh, people of course love the idea that they become kind of an expert in, in, in caring for something. If I become an expert in wine or an expert in cooking, I might also be an expert in repairing my own stuff, but there has to be something in it for me. Um, does every product need uh, that kind of experience design? Of course not. If you look at this one, this is a circular product, um, um, drinking straw to the right, and it has all the experiences built into it. Nobody wants to have an app with a, with a metal straw. It's a very simple product and there's no need to, um, but there's, there's an experience built into this, but it doesn't need any more service around this. It, it's a different thing, but with complex products like this one, um, of course, you all know uh, probably the different business models you could do with a thing like this. So either you have a very high premium quality product that, uh, that doesn't need almost any, any maintenance or repairment, it's expensive but you don't have to do anything about it. Then you have a hybrid model, which, uh, which has a good quality, but it means maintenance and, 
and repairment once in a while. And then you get into access where you don't own the product anymore with variable pricing or you even get it as a service. Well, everybody knows that example from washing machine, but it works nicely to explain that. So if you talk about experience design here, probably on the right, on the left part, it's very much a product focus. On the right part, it's very much service focus. And there's the space in between where it's kind of mixing. Am I actually dealing with, with the repairment and, and the management of the maintenance of a product or I, I, do I almost make the switch to only accessing the service? And that reflects also in the base user experience uh, strategies that you have and it comes to experience and communication design i believe it's very important to also manage the the, the communication and the, the the branding around this so if you have a high quality product then it's very much about ownership i own this thing i get familiar with it probably i will use it for 10 years so familiarity is a is a is a big one when it comes to a product that needs maintenance care could be uh, an, an interesting emotional focus so it's something i take take care of and i take pride in this or uh, some other emotional benefit with access of course it's carefree i don't own the thing i don't have to take care of it and when it comes to services it's, it's pure convenience where does that whole thing head to because we're just uh, starting to do projects in that field well if i have a hundred different do i do I want to have a hundred different twins uh, of the stuff I own, of course, do not. This is an example of a family and all the product in their house. This is what a, what, what a family with four people, they actually did this. They, they put all their stuff out of, on the lawn and you don't want an app for every single thing that is on the house this um, because you would have much, much more than, than three apps here. So what I believe will happen, and this is also like a hypothesis, that we will get something like capsules. You probably uh, know this from fashion. So capsule wardrobes are concepts also very much sold also in, in, in under the, the, the notion of sustainability that, that you don't need so many clothes if you buy them cleverly and they kind of interact with each other. So I believe that this whole thing of digital auras of products that also help for circularity will somehow connect. So I, don't, I won't have 100 uh, apps for 100 products but uh, what I will have is that, for instance, in the shop, I can make a decision on purchasing a product by, by looking into, does this somehow add to products that I already have? And you also, you already see this uh, in, in the industry. So this is an example of, of, a, of a wardrobe built up by elements that can uh, be reconfigured to, to get more bang for the, for the buck that I invested into the clothing. And what we see, for instance, with one client that we work for, Stiel, uh, it's a producer of uh, mainly um, big sauce, how you call it? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, power tools. That, that kind of development, power tools, yeah. So this is an example where you only have this one battery and it fits into all these machines. You have this one component. So that is, all, that is also already in, uh, a development in the direction of a capsule concept. Of course, it's a wall garden because you need uh, all the products from Stiel. So there, of course, there's marketing behind this. But it's certainly a good idea not to have an, an, uh, a battery in all of these uh, machines. And of course, do we want to take care of all this ourselves? I personally, I believe in the next five to 10 years, uh, it will be that we have to, to take as, as end consumers and users, we have to take care of stuff more and we have to, uh, to return them to the cycle and we have to play some role in there. But of course, all developments about convenience and ease of mind. So there will be machines and software at hand to, to take this from us. So I see, like, I see like three stages. Again, this is like a conceptual thing. The first one is twins. That's certainly happening, it happens right now. And, and, and this is certainly demanding a lot of activity from people. The next one is this capsule things where things start to talk to each other and kind of optimize uh, their, their, their usage for circularity. And the next step would be like banking. So uh, I have products, I don't have to care for them. Someone else is taking, taking care of that. But as I own or as I take uh, as I'm the steward of the materials and the components for, for the, the life cycle. Uh, there will be like financial banking now, there will be like tools that just take care of the, the, the materials and banking and, and brokering them back into the cycle. So I won't be busy anymore with, with apps, but I think this is like 10 to 15 years away. So the next five to 10 years at least we will be on the left part where people have to deal with that stuff and we should make it quite easy for them. One more thing, I'm almost through, uh, Marcus. 
I already mentioned communication and branding. And you know, one more thing always uh, happens in, in Apple um, presentations and Apple became very, very good at selling us uh, basically the same product with a few enhanced features every year. So that, that whole marketing around new stuff, new stuff, new stuff, buy the new thing. You, you can only be happy if you log uh, about the, the, the latest product. All the things I said before about experience design only can happen if we change this as well. It, it, it only works if you do this to, together. Um, so a thing, product that you probably all know from Patagonia, uh, um, Warnware, where they sell used products, well, actually clients sell to each other um, used products from Patagonia. They, they went further than just saying, well, used, used stuff is just basically just as good or just a little bit more shitty than the new stuff. They came up with a new narrative saying, no, it's actually better because this thing all ha already has, has been in the mountains. So there's some kind of quality and story into that product that makes it even more valuable than the new stuff. So yeah, I very strongly believe that next to the itsy bitsy stuff of user experience design and services and products, there are a lot of also has to happen on the branding and communication part. And a good example of this, I think, is Freitag. This was just posted uh, two weeks ago. They built a factory um, and you probably all know them. They produce these bags from old, uh, uh, from, from old truck um, coverage material. And uh, normally it's kind of uh, what piece do I get? What, what color do I get? Because it's all recycled material. And now they actually make this part of the experience. This is experience design because they, they opened the shop where you can, as a client yourself, create your own bag. So um, that's why I was asking Chris if he checked this uh, uh, flavor thing. Because I believe next to digital stuff, this will be interesting to make the, the circularity part of the fun, part of the story, part of the narrative built into the product, built into the uh, process of creating it. Um, so it doesn't need to be digital, but it has to be part of the, the product story. And it's a bit like Tom Sawyer, who uh, had himself paid for by his guys to actually do the job. I, I think Freitag is doing exactly that. They, they're getting paid for letting their own customers build the product because it's so much fun to do that. And as we all know, that story of the fans is one of the biggest memes in history. Um, if you look on the internet, this is like a big story. This is, was told over and over from generations to generations. It's very good marketing. And I think we need something like this to make uh, circular experience work. So this was the last thing I want to say, circular experience, circular communication, this really has to work together. Um, I just uh, launched a, a small platform where I want to discuss those issues called circularexperience.org. Uh, we just launched it yesterday, so there's a bunch of bugs and, 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 and misspellings there. Uh, but uh, yeah, um, thanks for stopping by <laughs> and having me and uh, yeah. I'm very interested in questions because uh, as I said before, this is kind of a work in progress. So, um, I think I about it, uh, it's, I love what happens when you mix disciplines there, you are actually addressing some of the same things that let's say, uh, sustainability or circular economy specialists are kind of referring to conceptually and you are showing, okay, but what it means in real life, uh, mixing twins, mixing all those kind of things that you have seen and experienced in your work. I think it's, uh, that's exactly why we do those things here as well to see and learn about it. Um, I, I really like the idea of, uh, and I've heard of this before as well, that uh, the idea of uh, things themselves keeping track of their value, like they had in a bicycle, an uh, uh, e-bike model, that at one point the, the bicycle will let you know that I am still valuable, but let's say in a couple of months, I most likely will break down here and there and you will lose 40% of my value. So we are actually, I think we are actually entering the era where more and more stuff is able to do that. Not only it's, it's, uh, it's, it's already done for more than 20 years in industry. So the whole notion of predictive maintenance, for instance, and, and big machinery and big industrial plants, it's all there. So we have the technology, we have the KI, we have, we have all the protocols necessary for that. But it's just done by, by B2B businesses and by professionals. 
And now we have to kind of translate this for, for normal people who, of course, don't know uh, anything about uh, mm -hmm. algorithms that, that can tell you, well, if you go now to the, to the bike shop just to make a small repair thing, it would probably be good to do something that you normally would do in two months because it's cheaper. And, and, and you can maintain the, the, the quality of your bike. Uh, consumers don't think that way. And, and so you have to build it into the, to the product or service, yeah. But mm -hmm. it's basically not, not a new thing. It's been done for, for more than 20 years. It's mostly, done, it's mostly done for the very expensive machinery that is complicated and expensive. Like, of course, yep. Siemens engines that uh, cost them 1 million euros, of course, you want to keep a good eye on it. But now the technology of the, of the sensors and everything is becoming easier, simpler and cheaper. Now we can actually use it in our house, household items as well. Yep. See? And uh, use applications like the one you described is exactly what we need to, to like, explain it basically. Does anyone I want to ask Peter anything uh, directly? Uh, um, uh, uh, might, uh, might has a question to Chris later on. Uh, but uh, do, do you have any questions to Peter? You're welcome to unmute yourself and jump in. And uh, I was just thinking about that, the third concept of how did you say the, the banking? I, I, I call, call it myself the butler of my things. So <laughs> I, a couple of days ago, I just for fun, I installed uh, Alexa to my home to play music and uh, <laughs> I, know it's, I know it's a stupid thing but at the same time we kind of have it already so you said that maybe in 15 20 years but i think that it's actually the like connecting the dots can be much much quicker why do you think it takes so much time um uh, it's 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 harder to implement that than, than just showing a conceptual study uh, so that's why I think it will take, it's, it's almost like, like autonomous driving and everybody thinks it will uh, like happen next year and it won't, it won't, it will take like, like five to 10 years. So technology is not, uh, not that fast. And, um, uh, again, the, the, the reasons why artificial intelligence and other technologies are now used in, in digital transformation is mostly to, to sell more stuff. So a lot of things will happen there, especially with, with things like Amazon. I'm, I'm very critical about that, even if we're a digital agency, but I have a lot of problems with them because it makes it very easy just to keep it coming, keep it coming. So if we want to change that, because Amazon would absolutely, as a, as a big player, not be interested in anything that I'm showing you here because it's simply not a business case for them. So different players have to do that. That's why I think it will take longer. And I'm not necessarily, uh, I'm saying that this is a good thing because what, what I was telling you earlier on, I think building relationships between people and stuff is, is, is important for circularity. It's important that you kind of feel that's a bad thing to throw something away. If you totally put this into a service and a kind of butler thing and, and some algorithm is taking care of it, I'm afraid that, it's, that exactly that relationship will be missing. So I would be happy if it won't happen and if people actually care for their stuff. But uh, as we know, if, if something can be digitized, it will be digitized and, and it, it will put into a service. And you see this is in banking as well. Um, and until five years ago, banking was about looking at the money I have and kind of managing what I have, taking care, in a way, taking care of what I have. And now digital banking becomes much more about in the future, I want to buy something. It's not the, all about the money I have now. It's about goals I have to, to purchase and banking kinds of turns around and making that possible. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not so sure if this is a good development. It's just that you talk, could, should take into consideration that this will, will happen to make it more convenient. And, and we are the ones who can kind of twitch it in the, in the right way. I think you're right. I think we, are, we have to make sure it's actually beneficial for, like, let's say, in environment or it has yes. other benefits uh, in addition to just creating value and creating user experience. Chris, uh, you have a question? I think it's, um, it's a comment, actually. Um, Peter, if that's okay, just to, I think, uh, expand a bit and build on your case study. Um, so I love what you were showing, by the way. I think it's it's, a, it's fantastic, really comprehensive, and I mean, and also brilliant to see 
um, circular design applied through kind of digital and, and service design a little bit more typically, you know, kind of lives in a world of product design and engineering and business models. So um, I really enjoyed your, your case study. I think this is, this is a comment. Um, so I, there was a slide in there that you showed, which was about, um, showed almost the design, you know, stages in a design process through materials and production and into use. And in a way, I thought you were being, you're probably underselling the impact of, of circular experience design. And, the, uh, uh, you know, by just saying, oh, it's just, you know, we can only really affect use phase, kind of use phase impacts when, when products or services are in the hands of users. And the reason I say that, and I, I guess what I would encourage you to do with this approach, and maybe I'll post this on your circular experience website, right, is have a, have a think about, um, so some products, right, have got their biggest impact in the use phase, others don't, right? So I'll give you an example, Nike shoes or Ikea furniture, 60, 70% of the footprint is in materials and design, right? So it's probably better to leave that to good old fashioned product designers like me, you know, kind of to um, make things more durable or, you know, kind of leave, leave you know, um, make, uh, uh, you know, uh, select materials in a smart way. But something like a bottle of shampoo, <laughs> or a body wash, right? 98% of the footprint is actually in the shower. <laughs> it's, yeah. in, it's when in the hands of consumers, right? And, um, you know, that, that's, that's, the, that's the opportunity here. There are, you know, endless numbers of categories, right? Where even though they are kind of, you know, the materials are designed, it's still hugely influenced by use phase and, 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 and consumer experience. And I think, that's a really interesting territory for you with this with this approach, you know, where you can, I mean, yeah, in a sense, you can, you know, almost redesign the behaviors to make usage more efficient um, and more and more circular. And I think, yeah, it's big, I think it's bigger than you think, right? You know, typically you would think it's a bottle of shampoo, it's in the packaging or the formulation, <clears throat> but actually the packaging and formulation impacts are how long you shower, when you shower, yep. <laughs> how hot your how hot your shower temperature is you know, kind of how, how much you switched it on before you got into the shower. It's a whole bunch of use phase things that are not designed in into the materials in the, in the product. And I think, I think there's a real big opportunity for that, for that kind of approach, um, which is probably isn't even typical service design territories. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's also the reality of uh, different, let's say shampoo example, is, I think it's a great example, but we will also have some sort of baseline that we most likely can't eradicate unless we are using waterless, uh, waterless shampoos, for example. So, but I think the tricky thing is exactly the, the, the sustainability questions is just to be able to navigate them, uh, is to understand like whether, where to, Put the emphasis and what to really exactly take into consideration. So, in a sense, Peter, your your approach was honest. That uh, okay, product design phase, I'm leaving it out because I just focus on another thing. But of course, they are complementary. Eventually, they will come to material choices as well. So, there's an abundance of choices that designers ha will have to make eventually, or at least have to be able to ask for, for someone to assist them with. It, it uh, depending on how complex or how, for instance, shareable a, pro a product is, uh, this whole idea of putting digital trims from heavy industry into like consumer uh, uh, products is also that that it can be a stepping stone in in, in local hyper local sharing because I I know where the product is I know in what state it is and may, maybe it makes it more easy for it to to share it with my my neighbor and I don't need some fancy uh, sharing platform from the Silicon Valley to do that. It's just the product that does it itself. So that again, it's, it's the, the product is existing. It has as many, as many energy and, and material in it as it is, but it starts using itself or promoting a, a more optimized use of itself uh, mm -hmm. based, based on data. And that, and that could reflect also uh, back to the, the way things are built. Um, this, this example I showed from, from Stiel, um, I, I believe some if some products would just be designed in a slightly different way. They would be, uh, let's say, fit fit prepared for sharing. It would be more easy, more convenient to share it with my neighbors because I don't have issues with hygiene or 
what happens if anything breaks? Do I have to pay for it? Does he pay for it? So there also could be like a, like a feedback loop into developing the actual product, developing maybe the, 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 the way it is sold by the data we get back from the market on how, act, how actually people use it. And if they would be prepared, for instance, to share something, it normally lies around for 20 hours a day. Yeah. I think it's very true that not all the strategies work with all the products. So no. fitting the strategy with the, with the product is the first essential question to understand. And it, for a variety of reasons, whether it's user preference, whether it's uh, value, or whether it's the manufacturing compl complications. And, uh, um, we might have might had a question about uh, so like exactly the manufacturing part as well. Uh, actually, to you, Chris, um, as he is currently in the office, so he can't uh, unmute himself. Uh, uh, <laughs> but I will. I, I will. Uh, he's curious about the uh, Fairphone at uh, Chris and he worked with. So he said that having worked in some of the big corporations, I wonder how you found all the right suppliers. The truth is that what happens in China, we have often very little control. So he's asking, were you involved in the process of selecting suppliers for the Fairphone? A difficult part with OEM type of business is that you never know how the components are made. On paper, it can say one, but having been in some of the factories, reality is another. Did you have the experience going through the suppliers with Fairphone? I mean, I can answer that, but I can probably only answer that second hand, right? Because um, most of the supplier selection was done by either, um, there was an engineering partner involved, like a, um, and also Fairphone really knows about the supply chain, particularly of sourcing some of the, um, some of the components. I mean, they've actually forgotten more of, about, of, on um, sourcing fairly than I even know. <laughs> you know, it's kind of, it's core to what they do. But um, I mean, it's probably easier to just explain the way they did that. Um, but now um, as an industrial design partner, as we were kind of hardware design partner, that's not typically something that we would we would we would have got involved in then so so in in, in the in the Fairphone two design project case which I didn't show today <laughs> interesting that I'm answering questions about it now but um um it uh it, it's it, there, there was a software design partner there was a hardware design partner and that was us and I was working in Seymour Powell at the time and then there was a kind of engineering and manufacturing you know almost yeah, an industrialization partner who was actually interestingly an ex Philips mobile phone um. Um, you know, used to run the mobile phone business. So he, he knew really about the, you know, kind of supply chain, um, you know, he had a brilliant network of kind of manufacturers and OEMs to select from in China, again, much better than I think any, any design partner or any, or many um, other engineering um, uh, consultancies would have, would have had. And I think what they did was they sort of combined his on the ground know-how with some, um, criteria and scrutiny that would come from Fairphone. So, I mean, my, my, my sense is that as a designer, right, you probably, particularly if you're in a bigger business, you don't need to know about sustainable supplier selection in great detail, right? What you need to do is team up with the department, you know, or team up with a specialist in, in ethical sourcing or in supply or in sustainable supply chain management, because they'll, you know, there's actually probably a better developed um, it's a more advanced field, right? There's 20 years of experience in, sust in sustainable supply chain management and endless numbers of standards and certifications to review review suppliers. So I think I think we don't, unless you're working with really small organisations, right? But I think if you're working in medium to large ones, it's probably better to team up with, you know, kind of in, in your design project with some experts who could help you to both review and vet and, you know, then select the appropriate partners you probably have to do some factory audits because of course if you're working with chinese suppliers or or suppliers in another country often what they say is not quite what they're the same as what they do um but um yeah i think yeah I, I think you know as designers i don't know whether we can become i think we can become experts in circular design but i think we should let other elements of this be led by the other subject experts and i think supply chain management is one where i think we can look to team up with other people rather than develop all, this, all the skills ourselves and like i say having been in i was in phillips in electrolux before and i know that if i was working in the design teams i'd just go and knock on the door of the ethical whatever sustainable supply chain department who would have endless lists and criteria of, <laughs> of suppliers to you know vet them and judge them and scorecards and all those kinds of things um yeah i mean 
there's a lovely story about a, a particular ingredient, a particular um, Fairphone um, ingredient, which which actually ma makes this much more personal because obviously the answer I just gave was a, was a process one. Uh, should I tell that, Marcus, or you, you, you want to go to another question? I'm all ears. I mean, Fairphone was an absolute dream client, right? Because you know it's very rare that you have somebody that really, you know, like a client that really wants to change the world. <laughs> um, you know, doesn't really care whether they want to, whether they sell any 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 products. You know, they, they literally just want to change the industry by by producing a product and show that it can be done. But um, they were they were they were specifying um, one particular component from tantalum, right? Tantalum's in capacitors in mobile in mobile phones, and they'd found their um, their manufacturing partner, which was in so I think the manufacturing partner was in China. The smelter for the ore from tantalum was in India, and obviously most tantalum is mined in the Congo, right? And, and, and Fairphone as a business comes out of an ethical mining campaign in the Democratic Republic of Congo, so they know that supply chain, you know, really in, in quite detail. You know, they've got people who, who've audited mines and checked for child labour and, you know, get, applied for you know fair fair trade certificates to mines. They really know that. But actually, when they were producing the capacitors that they wanted to be conflict-free certified. They literally had a couple of their ethical mining people stand over the mine, <laughs> observe 26 kilos of, of, you know, equivalent of tantalum ore being, you know, kind of dug out of the ground, put in a suitcase, <laughs> they carried it to the airport, <laughs> you know, kind of jumped on a plane, flew it to India and, <laughs> and handed it over by hand to the, uh, to the, to the, to the smelter. And, um, I just love that story, right? That, you, that your supply chains are so personal and so, um, you know, almost so so small scale, right? <laughs> yeah, obviously, without the flights, it would be ideal. But um, you, you know, and I guess they they were so small, they were doing a run of twenty five thousand products, and that's all they needed in that in that case. Um, but yeah, I, I kind of love that story, and um, it's obviously in in the product that we worked on, they they also um, they were trying to um, specify um, fair trade gold. Right. And interestingly, getting fair trade gold into China proved unbelievably difficult. Right. If you weren't making product in China, um, you, you know, it'd be really easy to just whatever kind of specify a certain amount. But of course, all gold imports <laughs> into China are controlled by the state. So, <laughs> so you can't, um, you know, you can't ask a manufacturer to specify a particular sort of gold. It's, it's all, you know, it's all kind of really, really carefully regulated and carefully controlled. So. So their approach had to be to do to do what what's called a mass balance, right? So they actually had to sort of buy and input a certain tonnage or kilograms of fair trade gold into the overall state controlled system. And actually, the phone that you're buying might only have one gram or, or a fraction of a gram of the fair trade gold. Um, and that and that's the, that's the reality of some of these supply chains that are so unbelievably complex, um, different country by country, different material by material, and um, yeah, I wish I had a simple answer for how to how, how to do that. I think you just got to take it almost on a case by case basis. Mike says uh, thanks for the answer. Great insight um, for the for the question here. And I think like the designers are, are you absolutely right in that designers always have to or the product and circular economy you have to be realistic of the systems around anything you design. So it's not just it can't be really straightforward. It's it's a lot of hassle to get the like straightforward supply chain in place. You always have to have to look at the like surrounding economics and the regulations and the other rules and other like supply chain networks. So like again, uh, being able to navigate it is again difficult. So that's why like that's why people who have learned about them become useful into when you really are, uh, let's say, just or when you really want to do some sort of uh, circular or fair trade. Yeah. It's always like. The, the complexity of the world is standing against sustainability in, in that, that sense. So like we have to find uh, leverage and we have to find some kind of uh, windows of opportunity where we can make it happen. Global supply chain is basically a black box and will be will remain a black box for a long, long time, even with all the supply chain transparency tools that are available. But still, like, if you want to source something very particular, especially if you're a small company, it's almost impossible. Big ones are that they can choose, but even like uh, choosing the right plastic, 
it can take uh, like if you have design tweaks, like in some work that I work with, uh, with huge companies is like they want a particular form of aluminum. And it's just uh, talking with the aluminum manufacturer, they say, that, okay, it's, uh, it's technically impossible, but we can work with it and we can possibly come up with a product in a year. So uh, it's a tedious process. So like those examples such as Fairphone and other things are extremely important to lead the way that uh, no one can say that we can't be done. It always can be done. The question is the amount of effort you want to put into. Um, if, uh, if you have any questions, uh, you're open to unmute yourself. I mean, I just want to add one thing to what you said, Marcus, which is, I mean, I think it's uh, to do a fair product or even a sustainable product. I think it's a 20 year commitment, right? Yeah. Um, you know, I, think, I think it's really difficult. You know, it, it would have been so much easier if Fairphone had designed a carpet, right? You know, kind of single material, easy to control, you know, but complex products, you know, 600 components in the average mobile phone, right? Mm -hmm. The entire periodic table of elements, just never do it in one design iteration. And I suppose what I would encourage people is that, to, to, to remember is that kind of good is not the enemy of perfect, right? You're never gonna get 100%, particularly with complex products like that. And this, I think Peter's story is the same, right? That his clients, you know, kind of allowed them to do a certain amount and then they pushed it along on, on their own afterwards sort of further and I think you know we are on a journey with all of this stuff and um, you know you can, it's very very rare that you can cut it all off in one in one design project. Yeah. And the responsibility or the, the 20 year commitment it goes also both ways it's just like the amount of effort that is needed but also the promises you make in your supply chain. If you source good source have good material good grade cobalt or tantalium then if you just like don't establish a mutual relationship that they can also later depend on, depend on then it's, um, it, it may not be very beneficial at all in the long run. So it is about, and it's great, it's kind of this personal experience. And, and Peter, I liked actually like how you, uh, how you brought back the, the people's connection with the material and with, uh, with products. Because everything is kind of the hyper reality is going to the to, to the direction of virtual reality, and we don't care about anything anymore. But there's something there might be just something missing, and being able to identify what is missing in the user experience and uh, catering for it. I think uh, I'm glad you pointed brought it out, so we don't completely forget about it. If the thank you very much, one for joining. Thank you so much, Chris and, and Peter, for presenting today. It has been an insightful one and a half hours. Um, the the how-to session, we will conclude the how-to session for today. And stay tuned for the next sessions that we can come up probably next year already. And meanwhile, um, stay safe, stay, stay fine, keep distance, and uh, we'll overcome it. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, guys. Yeah. Bye. Thanks, Marcus. Ciao.